G. Edward Griffin is a living legend. He is the person who popularized the scrutiny of the Federal Reserve System and has brought it to the alternative media. There is still little known about the origins of this organization and its stock ownership. It is filled with mystery. In this interview, Mr. Griffin goes into the deep woods and talks about the nature of the beast. Never has PortfolioWealthGlobal.com put such an extensive PDF report along with our guest on his most important notes and points. Make sure you look at Mr. Griffin's entire body of work, which includes amazing scoops at an exclusive report we put together at PortfolioWealthGlobal.com forward slash Griffin. Go there now. Enjoy the interview. Welcome to the Industry Experts Panel at PortfolioWealthGlobal.com. My name is Michelle Holliday. Today, we are welcoming back to the show one of our favorite guests, Mr. G. Edward Griffin, who is a legend in matters of the Federal Reserve. For anyone who is not yet familiar with Mr. Griffin, we have put together a report about his extensive body of work. It is the only profile of its kind online. The link is at PortfolioWealthGlobal.com slash G. And for all of those Creature of Jekyll Island fans out there, this is a phenomenal PDF report, and we are honored right now to be joined by Mr. G. Edward Griffin. Ed, welcome back to the show. How are you today? I'm very well. Michelle, thank you for that uh, very kind introduction. It's always amazing to have you here. Ed, we want to start off, of course, with the Fed. At this point, do you feel that the Fed has lost control of the economy? Uh, the reason I'm pausing on that, because I was thinking of all the different ways you could define control. Uh, and uh, I think that the short answer and probably the most honest answer is no. Uh, the Fed still is in control of the economy. Um, but most people... Uh, have trouble understanding what the Fed is and what and what they would consider to be uh, good or bad. What I'm trying to say is this. Uh, when I started to research this uh, years ago, I, I faced the same kind of problem that many people are facing today when they're, for the first time in their lives, taking a serious look at what the Federal Reserve is supposed to do and not supposed to do. And they always come up, as I did, with the idea, well, they're failing. They're not doing it right. Don't they know? Are they stupid? Can't they see what I see? This isn't working. And it's not working, right. guys. You know? <laughs> Am I and, the smartest person ever or what? <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> and, and so the problem is that in that neophyte stage of understanding what's really going on in the world, we think that it's not working because we're looking at it from our perspective. It's not working for us, but it's working very well indeed for them. For, you them, see. Right. for them, and we forget that there's a, a, there's a dichotomy of viewpoint there. So when, when we say they've lost control, usually that means, well, things are not going right. See, the economy is, is uh, going cattywampus. It's failing. People are out of jobs. They're homeless. Don't you see? They, they've lost control. No, they haven't lost control. That's exactly what they want to see happen because that's, you know, well, for reasons we can get to later on, this is very much part of the plan. Uh, so my, my honest and short answer is no, they have not lost control. I certainly hope that because of our efforts, they will lose control someday soon because, uh, as you well know, uh, you've read my book, my view is rather harsh on this. I think that if, if we don't abolish the Federal Reserve System, the Federal Reserve System will abolish America, will abolish us. It's really a life and death struggle. You know, Ed, it just seems like we have red lights flashing danger all around us really at this point in time. Um, real quick, I wanna to touch on what's going on with Congress. Um, we've had um, AOC, Alexandra Ocasio-Cortez with her Green Deal come up. And I really wanna get your take on this because this is very current. It's a $40 trillion deal over the next 10 years that they're they're sort of couching as a green deal, but it's supposed to be 70% taxation on the top 1% of uh, wealth, uh, which only makes up for $2 trillion. So where is the other $38 trillion going to come from, and what do you make of this? Well, the other amount of money isn't going to come from anywhere because it's not going to happen. Right. I mean, 
people can come up with these wild fantasies and uh, you know they can say well uh, i can i can live forever uh, i'm going to live forever well i'm going to live forever but that doesn't mean they're going to live forever just because they say they're going to do it because it's impossible to live forever as far as we know anyway and uh, certainly in the field of econ economics we have a pretty good idea of what's possible and what's not possible because we not only have a lot of history to go on, but we've got certain mathematical equations. As far as I know, two and two still equals four. <laughs> so anyway, it's not going to happen. It's a dream. It's a pipe dream. It's, a, it's actually worse than that. I, I, I think in her case, it's probably naivety. I mean, the poor girl doesn't seem to be too bright. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> just listening to her and these schemes that she comes up with, she's been imbued with this... Um, with the myth of Marxism, you know, from each according to his ability to each according to his need, which sounds very good. And of course, it is good in its purest form, but nobody ever asks the question, well, how and uh, how are you going to do this thing? Are you, you going to make everybody um, equal? Really? You really want to do that? Or are you just talking about having equal opportunity, equal um, equal treatment under the law? Or are you talking about you want everybody the same height, with the same color hair, and the same color eyes? What are we talking about when we say that? Well, are the people in Congress, are, you're not talking about making everybody equal with the same color hair, the same color eyes, the same height, the same weight, the same thought patterns, the same job, the same pay scale. It's impossible. It's not going to happen, but they can advocate it all they want. And they can mess up a lot of things along the way trying to make it happen. So you asked me my take on that. That's part of it. I think it's 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 really kind of silly. And I, I don't think that even the most politically naive person, and there are a lot of those out there, I used to be one of them, and not very many people take that seriously because they know instinctively this is nonsense. This is a pipe dream. And it wouldn't even be good if it were possible. Wouldn't it be terrible if we were all exactly alike? Oh my gosh, that would be horrible. <laughs> well, I just... Right, which is just so extraordinary that the media is embracing it. The entire Democratic craft of party is embracing it. Mm. It's just, um, it's an extraordinary sign of the times, I guess. So, yes. Well, there's, there's, it's, it's not just so much uh, extraordinary because it's not really extraordinary because it's been going on for a long, long time. Uh, the Hegelian principle is an important thing for people to understand. Uh, if you want to... Uh, in politics and in social engineering and, and, and opinion engineering and all that sort of thing, which is necessary in our day and age, where people like to think that they have control over their own political destiny, that they get to go to the polls and they vote. So they think, well, I'm voting, and therefore everything that happens, well, that's my fault because I voted for it. So I have to accept it. I have to like it. It's kind of one of those brain games they're playing with us now. What the people don't realize is that they're voting uh, on a debate that's been perfectly uh, organized ahead of time. There's not really a debate. You know, we do A or B, but we don't have an option to do C. It's never discussed. And C is where the solution is. Um, you know, we're going to vote Republican or Democrat. Well, is that our only choice? Is we had to vote for, you know, the two teams that are both owned by the same billionaire? Uh, you, you lose either way. This kind of a thing goes on all the time. So, but, but the, you know, the issue is that people, even the, the most naive political person understands that these issues that are being discussed, like you're talking about, are not real. They're not going to happen. And, and I think it's just kind of a diversion because there are some very serious issues going on daily as we speak. The Federal Reserve is one of them. Our monetary system is one of them. Our sovereignty is another one. We're surrendering our sovereignty by the day. International treaties and... Uh, and uh, the educational system is conditioning young people to think that we really should get rid of all national boundaries because we live in a new world now. We should have a global government. And these things are big. These are going to affect our lives. These things can happen. And they are happening. It's not this fantasy world of, gee, we're going we're gonna to put a chicken in every pot and a car in every garage. It's not going to happen. But these other things are happening. But we don't talk about the really important things because we're all looking at, uh, you know, like dancing with the stars and political propositions about uh, making everybody um, not having to work. So I think it's not altogether stupidity. I think there's kind of a little bit of strategy going on there. And I think the media is definitely complicit in this. They want to keep us distracted with these silly things. Meanwhile, we don't look 
at the really important things that are going on every day. That's a really interesting take on it because everyone's sort of like, you know, hypnotized right now Mm -hmm. with this while we've got enormous problems happening. Well, back to the Fed. Well, uh, let me just continue that if I may. The reason everyone is hypnotized is because the media is hypnotizing them. If the media didn't hammer this day in and day out, morning news at night, all the newscasts, all the commentaries, it's because every time you go to the controlled media, that's what you get. You are hypnotized. It's a good phrase. Now, if this were a free, a really free uh, media environment, you'd be having people uh, talking about other things as well. It's not, if you've noticed in the media, it all moves together. I don't care what channel you go to, ABC, CBS, NBC, Turner. I mean, all of these, uh, now even the, uh, you know, Facebook, YouTube, uh, every place you go for information, it's all the same thing. Well, that didn't just happen. And it is a form of hypnosis. I think it's a great analogy. Hmm, that's very interesting, too. It's the same topic. Um, Fox may have a different take than CNN, but they're all talking about the same thing. The same thing, yeah. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Okay, now back to the Fed. Originally, the Fed's mandate was to keep unemployment levels stable and low, and the same with inflation. But in recent years, it seems that they're more interested in making sure that their elite wealthy friends are seeing a rising stock market. Is the Fed at the mercy of the markets? Because three months ago, it was said that interest rates were a long way from neutral. But just recently, we've been hearing about the need to probably cut rates and pause hikes for sure. It almost seems like they do not have a clear plan. What are your thoughts? Well, I do have some very strong thoughts on that also. And they're parallel in many ways to what we were just talking about. Uh, You get the idea that uh, I... I see that the real world in which we live is not at all like how I was taught when I was in school and how I viewed it as a young man. It's not at all like it's presented on the news media. You mentioned the market. When we use the word the market, we assume, most of us assume that that word implies a free market. It means it's an entity of its own, has its own will. And you ask, is the Is the Fed controlled by the market? I think the real question is, is the market controlled by the Fed? And in fact, it really is. The the market no longer is what we used to call the free market. It does not respond to the forces of supply and demand because those have been preempted. The Federal Reserve created this, uh, you know, this little committee that I think they call it the... uh, anti-crash committee or something like that. I've forgotten what it was. And they deliberately interfere in the market with huge transfers of money. The Fed, you know, is, when we think about the Fed, I think it's important for your, your viewers to understand the Fed is not a government agency. No way is it a government agency it pretends to be. And uh, a lot of people think it is, but it's a cartel. It's no different than a banana cartel or, you know, an oil cartel except it's a banking cartel. It's an association of banks. And all of the major banks in the United States are members of this cartel. They call the cartel the Federal Reserve System. And it seems like it's a government agency because when they wrote the cartel agreement on Jekyll Island, which is why I call my book The Creature from Jekyll Island, private island off the coast of Georgia, back in 1910, when they created the Federal Reserve, on that island in a private meeting that took place there. Uh, and they created the cartel and they created the cartel agreement. And then they took it to Congress. And over the next three years, they sold it to Congress. And if you can imagine in your mind, what they did is effectively take a big fat eraser and they erased the top of the page where it said cartel agreement and they erased that. And then they carefully wrote in federal reserve act and they passed it into law. So what we have now is a law passed by Congress that in essence is a cartel agreement. So now a cartel agreement, which has nothing to do with the government, has the force of government behind it because it was passed into law. So now you and I, if we violate the terms of this cartel, we go to prison. And therefore, we think, well, only government can put us into prison, right? Well, that's true. But it leaves open the question is, who captured the government? 
and there lies the answer. So it was originally called the Cartel Agreement. No, no, I say it was figuratively speaking. They, oh. no, they, they knew they were drafting legislation, but the, the essence of it was a cartel agreement. They agreed how to control their own industry. They knew, here, let's make it simple, they knew because of rising public uh, alarm over what was happening in the, in the banking industry, they, the public knew that they were getting ripped off. There were control over money supply, control over who gets credit, the interest rates, and so forth. And so there was a demand for, for reform in banking. They wanted legislation. They wanted Congress to control this, this, these big bad bankers on Wall Street. And so the banks realized that there was going to be a law to control their industry. And wisely, they decided, we're not going to just sit here and let some yokels from the hinterland draft legislation to control our industry. We will draft the legislation to control our industry to our specifications and make it look like it was a means of, you know, putting us under the control of the political system. But in reality, it was the other way around. They were putting the political system under the control of the banks. But they did it in this very clever way of putting it into legislation. And then, of course, all they had to do was get the congressmen and the senators to vote for it. And so that, well, you know that history. It's quite a fascinating way in which the, um, the banks became psychopoliticians, not only bankers, but very clever psychopoliticians. They knew how to manipulate public opinion, and they knew how to get Congress to do what they wanted to do. So back to the question, what we really have is a banking cartel. And, it, and so what does a banking cartel do? Well, it is, is designed like any other cartel to advance the interests of the members of the cartel, period. Now, the, the Congress, I mean, the, uh, the chairman of the Federal Reserve occasionally goes before a committee of Congress and he has to testify. And you got all these congressmen up there or senators in some cases and they're asking him questions. And you get the impression, well, look, those people up there at the dais, they're in charge, right? And the chairman sits there and he answers questions. And he says, yes, sir, no, sir, and there's the answer. And sometimes, sometimes they'll ask him, um, you know, Mr. Chairman of the Fed and Mr. Chairman, uh, when are you going to release the data on such and such an issue? And he'll look at this guy. He says, oh, no, we're not going to do that. What do you mean you're not going to do that? Don't you have to report this to Congress? Mm, no, we don't. And it's true. If you read the cartel agreement called the Federal Reserve Act, they do, they do not have to uh, do anything that Congress or the president says. They are an independent body. They are the source of decision making. They determine policy. Now, it's true they have to report now and then to Congress, but they don't have to tell anything that they don't want to. They are in charge. That's my point. And once you get that picture, then everything clears up because now we understand that they are not making mistakes. Uh, the, the, the fact that the economy is not is doing as well as we might think it would want is not because they're failing. It's because they're succeeding. They are plundering the economy. It's their special interests are reaping the benefits of the productive capacity of the nation. And they're ripping it off through interest rates and fees and fines and, you know, all kinds of underhanded deals and inside deals. And everything. They've rigged it. It's the predator class has captured control of our economic system. And so they're not failing. If we had to give them a report card on the basis of the mandate that you mentioned a moment ago, you know, to keep employment high and uh, interest rates low, who, that's not the mandate. We think it's the mandate. The mandate really is to profit, bring profit, maximum profit to the banking industry. That's the mandate. But they don't tell anybody that because then people would say, hey, I don't think we need this thing called the Fed. Yeah, they would, right? <laughs> yeah, they sure would. <laughs> so they have to go is. through this. They have to go through these um, uh, the motion of making it look like they're serving the best interests of the people. So when the when the Federal Reserve Chairman testifies and the Congressman says, "Well, Mr. Chairman, why are you raising interest rates?" Uh, it wouldn't go well if it well. Dummy, the reason we're raising interest rates is because we can and we can get more interest, more money into the banking system by increasing rates. That's why we're raising rates, but that wouldn't go over too well. So he says, well, we're raising interest rates because we want to cool down inflation for you folks. We're really concerned about you people. We want the economy to succeed. So we don't want rampant inflation. So we're raising interest rates 
for you folks, you see. Oh, well, yeah, well, you're not doing too well. Yeah, we know we have a lot of, a lot to learn, but we're trying, you know, we're in their heart. No, they're not trying at all. See, that's the thing. It's a game they play, and it's about time that people wake up to this game and get out of the illusion and face reality. It's very devious, and all it takes is a little bit of education going back in history to find out what happened. Oh, so yes, and this is not theory. They talk about it themselves. I mean, you can get everything I said just now, which sounds extreme, probably to many people, because maybe it's the first time they've heard it, but these bankers themselves say these things. If you read their materials, go to their books, their interviews, uh, their biographies, their friends, you know, the minutes of the meetings of the boards of directors, you read these things, they say these things. They laugh at the American people for being such fools for believing their, this propaganda. I do think they think the American people are a joke because they do, the they do it in front of us. They tell mm -hmm. us what they're doing, and mm -hmm. then we go to work and pay them <laughs> our money. <laughs> pay them money. <laughs> That's right. Now, Ed, do you think that Powell gets orders from high above, from what is termed to be the deep state. What's your impression? Well, you asked some tough questions. Uh, can, can, we, can we go back to kindergarten stuff? <laughs> <laughs> right. Right. Uh, We've got you here. We want to know, Ed. <laughs> yeah. I think what we call the deep state, there are different names for it. Um, the deep state, the elite uh, the powers that be, you know, the different names. There's no doubt in my mind that that the people who we see on television all the time as the leaders of the nation, and this is true of all nations, they themselves are not the source of the power. The presidents, the prime ministers, all of those people, even the heads of the Federal Reserve System, the chairman of the Federal Reserve System, they're the figureheads. They are not the, the power themselves. They come and they go. They come and they go. We have elections, appointments. Their term is short. They, they're like a bright flash for a while, and then they're gone. They're part of history. But this group that's behind them continues. Now, of course, there's a rotation there, too, but you don't, we don't see them. We don't see their names very much. Uh, take the, Rock, the Rockefellers and the Rothschilds, for example. Now we're talking about top-tier control. These people do have the power. It is in their hands, and they, they are the king makers. They and their, their representatives, like Henry Kissinger, for example, is really, I like to think of him as the high-level bagman for the Rockefeller dynasty. That's, that's how Kissinger uh, came into power. Uh, that's why he's at, invited to every important meeting, it's because he represents the Rockefeller interest. And so when we get to that level, it gets kind of murky because they don't work out in the open light. Uh, they are pretty much behind the scenes and they, they've written books as to why they do that. They don't want to be in the limelight. They really want people to be looking at the puppets that they can bring up and then extinguish if they don't like what the puppet is doing. They can get rid of them. They'd like to have the public focusing on Mr. You know, Mr. President or Mr. Prime Minister, and oh man, that, well, what happened to him? And this president, he was good at first. Now, look what happened to him. Get a new one in there. Meanwhile, the people that are pulling the strings on all of the puppets aren't even mentioned in the news. So that's my view on it. I think it's um, once you start to read the material of these people themselves, and including the puppets, you read some of the books that are written and the statements written by you know, the presidents of the United States after they're out of office and they're in retirement in their memoirs and so forth. Um, all the way down from uh, Woodrow Wilson to FDR. Uh, I, anyway, yeah, it's, it's a big topic. But most of these men in their off moments will say, well, yeah, uh, you have no idea what's going on and, and where the power lies. These forces are hidden. They say these are the people who are in this mainstream and benefiting from it. And in their unguarded moments, they'll say, yep, of course, we all know that. Don't you know that <laughs> sort of thing? They go to these meetings at Davos in Switzerland, and, and uh, they go to these private meetings in the, the Bilderberg Group, and they all know that they are not the power. And they go there to find out what they're supposed to do and when they're supposed to do it and what the party line is. And it's, uh, 
once you get into once you get into that literature, and again, I want to remind your listeners that this is not the literature I'm talking about comes from those people. They they speak about it themselves. It's not something that I or other critics might come up with. We just study what they say. Council on Foreign Relations is very clear about how they operate. There are 4,000 people, more or less, 4,400 some people in the United States. And you look at the list of members, these, these are not just the guys working in the shoe industry or, you know, over there in construction or something. These are all politicians or presidents of the United States, the Supreme Court, senators. They're all heads of, of the largest corporations in the world. They're heads of ABC, CBS, NBC, you know, Washington Post, New York Times, uh, Los Angeles Times, Time Magazine, USA Today, and so on. Go on, look at these 4,000 names. They are the hidden power behind everything that happens in the United States and to a large extent around the world. And there they are. It's right out in the open. How come all of these people in these critical positions are all part of one organization? Don't you think we should be curious about that organization? Well, yeah, I'm very curious. And it's interesting because you... You don't have to dig very far to find out what they believe in. Go to their own literature and they'll tell you that their goal is to create a new world order. This is their phrase, a new world order based on the model of collectivism, which means, first of all, they want world government. That means they want the end of the United States as a sovereign nation. They want the end of America as a sovereign nation. They want it to be merged into a global a government with them in control, of course, at, through the United Nations. And um, so um, right away, we know that all of these people in charge of these high positions in America want the end of America as we have known it. Well, that's kind of profound, isn't it? That's why these are the people who are in these high positions in government making decisions of what goes on at, in the polls, who you can vote for, who the candidates have been selected. They're all in agreement with the master strategy. Uh -huh. You have no choice. You can be well, Republican or Democrat, but you've noticed the wars go on <laughs> on the Republicans and Democrats, and both candidates say, elect me and we'll put an end to these wars. Well, yeah, we elect them. And we go from party to party, but the wars continue just the same. And that's, yeah, that's true of all of them. I mean, I think it was... Um, uh, it was Obama said he was going to stop these wars in the Middle East, and of course he increased them. And now it was then. It's, now it's Mr. Trump said he's going to bring our troops home. He's going to put an end to these wars, and he's increased the military support in the Middle East. They've all said, "Yeah, the Federal Reserve is terrible. Look what they're doing to the economy." And they all support the Federal Reserve once they're in office. Wake up, everybody! Don't you see that the scam is unfolding before your eyes, and you don't want to see it because it's so horrible. It means, it means that you've been lied to. It means you've been played for as a sucker. It means you better do something about it, or you're going to lose everything. That's why it's hard for people to see it. Is because they understand at this subconscious level that, oh my gosh, I'm in trouble. We're all in trouble. And nobody wants to face up to that. They'd rather live in that company world. Oh, well, I'm sure that uh, Q is going to take care of it. Some These pe good people are hidden in government. Oh, they're going to come out and, and they're going to save us and we don't have to do anything. Well, I told you I was going to ramble a lot <laughs> and now I'm proving that point. We but when I get into these topics and you hit some really good ones, it's like opening up one door and then there are three doors on the other side. Then you open one more and there are three doors on the other side. This is a, is a huge concept here of controlling society. How can a few people, a very few people, 1% of the population, control 99% of the population? And we're touching on some of the mechanisms right now, how that is possible. It, that is really just... Um it's outrageous if you step back and look at the fact that these are very few people controlling massive amounts of people. And the way that they've gotten into power to do this has been so orchestrated behind the scenes over decades and decades. And it's just, um, I don't know, it just seem, it seems so, um, it's almost diabolical, Mr. Griffin. But how do we go about, I mean, besides, I just think, honestly, that we should all run for office. I mean, all of the concern, I mean, I, I just really think that our butts in the chairs of these decisions, but let me ask you something. If we did, because of the power that they yield, say I ran for office, because of the power they yield, are they so powerful, I would become one of what we call, you know, the puppets 
I mean, is that just something that is inevitable? No, I don't think it's inevitable. That's the easy part to your question. It's certainly not inevitable. I think if there are just enough people who understand uh, what's going on and have the courage to, uh, to face it down, and it does take courage because if anybody stands up against these very powerful forces, they are at risk. And, um, and now when I say that, I don't mean that they're going to be assassinated necessarily, although that is definitely on the list, but it's usually the last option. They can control people in a lot uh, better ways than that. First of all, uh, I, I've studied this, how they operate for a long time. And it's pretty clear that the first thing they do, if they have someone like you or me, who is uh, speaking out against what's happening and exposing their plans, but the first thing they do is ignore it. <laughs> and this is a very effective uh, strategy because for the most part, uh, their opponents are underfunded. They have no means to massive communications. They're a little voice. They might be a little spark. They do something that captures attention. Oh, look, here's a rising star over here. But they have no money. They have no support. And they just wither away. And the first thing you know, oh, well, whatever happened to so-and-so? Well, I don't know. I haven't heard from them in a long time. They just don't have the staying power. Our opponents know that. And so the first step is just let them, let them alone. They'll disappear. Now, if that doesn't work, and for some reason they do manage to get some funding and some following and they begin to grow, now the next step is to destroy them in the media, to, uh, to convince the world that these are bad people. And uh, many people have something in their background that could be used uh, to um, be evidence of that fact. They'll find something if they can. And they'll blow it up way out of proportion usually. Sometimes they really find a, a genuine skeleton. Uh, but if they don't, they'll plant a skeleton, a skeleton in there and they'll then find it and it won't be real. But the public won't know that because they, they'll, all they'd say is, my gosh, look, it's in the newspaper. Or, this person is a pedophilia uh, or this person is a tax evader or this person has uh, uh, three girlfriends or something. I, well, this poor wife, what you can, you know, they make things up. Or sometimes they're partially true, sometimes partially. It doesn't make any difference, no matter what they put in the media, that people will believe it. I have to laugh. I'll tell a little side story. Um, my mother-in-law, God bless her, she's gone now, but she was an amazing woman in many ways. I admired her a lot. But she had a, she had a funny thing she used to say about the newspapers. Now, you can't believe anything in the newspapers. It's all lies, she would say. I think, yeah, that's right, Mom, it's true. And then she'd be sitting there reading the newspaper in the morning, and she'd say, listen to this, and she'd start to read something off. So, and I thought it was kind of a, an example of what goes on in the public mind. We know that you can't believe the media, but knowing yes, it, do. still people believe the media. Right, right, exactly. <laughs> so, That's... so that was the next thing, is to destroy a person in the media is, is relatively easy if you own the media. And they do. Look at this Council on Foreign Relations list. These people own that, all the major media outlets. And so they do have that power. And so that usually is enough to knock somebody out of the cell. And if that doesn't work, the next step is to come to them and infuse them with money. And they say, well, you know, Mr. Jones, we've been looking at your efforts here. And we like what you're doing. Now, we don't agree with everything, but we think you're, you're a good uh, uh, what you're onto is a good thing. You're a good candidate, let's say, and, and we'll put some money behind you. We'll make you president. We can do that, you know. But all we ask is that when it comes time to make appointments to the Federal Reserve System or to the uh, uh, Secretary of State or Secretary of Defense or whatever it is, that you will consider our list of nominees. <laughs> And of course, well, yes. Uh, how many millions are you going to put into my campaign? <laughs> oh, yeah, I, I could look at your list of nominees. And could they make a deal, in other words? Uh, like President Trump said, he went to meet Mr. Kissinger one day and spent a whole day with him. And he told the world, he said, you know, vote for me because I'm a deal maker. I make deals. So we know what he did with Mr. Kissinger that day. He made a deal. We don't know what the deal is. But Mr. Trump told us that he's a deal maker and he can work with anybody. So this is how it works. Now, somebody offered a lot of money. I mean, even to Mr. Trump, there's, there are people with a lot more money than Mr. Trump, people who could make him president, people who could uh, uh, give him all of, the, all of the best investment opportunities for his real estate projects that you can imagine. And so that's how they approach people. It might be an organization. They say, your organization needs money, doesn't it? Oh, man, does it ever. Well, we're thinking about making a a fairly generous donation of perhaps $5 million. And, and if that works out, maybe we could do 
10 million annually after that. And is it, does that interest you, sir? Oh, yeah, does it interest you? Yeah, of course. Well, all we ask, of course, is that um, you might consider putting on your board of directors uh, some people that we would suggest to make sure that our money is being spent as we hope it will be. Would that be acceptable? Oh, yes, sir. Put them on. Load up the board of directors. Take over the organization. And they give, they use money. They say, well, how would you like to retire, Mr. Smith? We can, we can get you a nice office and a penthouse there in New York. You don't have to do anything, but we'll give you a $3 million annual salary and an expense account. And uh, you just keep your big mouth shut. How's that sound? Oh, that sounds pretty good. I'm tired of this battle anyway. So the, my point is, the next step is to use money to get people out of the way. And if that doesn't work, well, then the jackals might show up and the game gets a little uh, more rough. So you know what you're up against when you go into these battles, but uh, if you really care, if you have that crusader gene that some of us have, it doesn't make any difference what the obstacles are. You just have to stand for what is right. So we come back to your question. Could you run for office? What would happen to you? Yes, you could run for office. But what would happen to you is they would attack you. They would try to destroy you. And unless you uh, knew that going into it, uh, you might weaken and drop out. So uh, I hope that you do go into office, as a matter of fact. But be, expect, be expecting a one heck of a battle and don't expect it to be fair. Wow. You really have to be a warrior. To a warrior. Do. That's exactly it. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Now, Ed, shifting gears just a little bit, what are your thoughts on how this debt crisis will unfold when it happens? Will it be a market shock, a currency or society crisis, or all of the above? I have no idea. Hmm. I have no idea. They, uh, they have the capability of making it all of the above. And I think, back to your question, what would happen if good people were attempting to take over or recapture control of their system, it would not be uh, unimaginable to think that they would crash the whole system completely. Like in a military campaign, if you're in retreat, you burn everything as you retreat, so there's nothing left for your enemy when you get out of there. Uh, and if, if not for that purpose, at least to say, look, you see, everything was fine until these people started to get nosy and they want to take over and what they call reform you see what happened well we just had a huge huge crash in the economy that's what happened nicholas biddle tried that when the they when andrew uh, jackson did his war against the uh, bank of uh, u.s bank uh, the, the third what you call it the uh, you know the central bank we, we've had central banks before and andy jackson uh, did battle with them and uh, they they deliberately tried to bring the economy down so they could blame Andrew Jackson for it. And if it hadn't been for some accidental leakage of information and the newspaper picked it up and said, look, this was done not by Jackson, but it was done by Biddle himself, the head of the central bank. Well, then everything turned around. So it was a, we know what they can do. They would do anything. They would destroy America rather than lose their power. That's very revealing. Now, um, next question. Do you feel that President Trump is setting up the Fed to be the scapegoat in the case of a coming economic downturn before the 2020 elections? And do you think that Trump has a good chance of getting reelected? Well, those are a couple of different questions there. Um, first of all, I, I, I believe that Mr. Trump has no intention of seriously challenging the Federal Reserve. I mean, he's, he's put Fed people into his administration. He's appointed heads of these multinational banks, and uh, he has shown no real interest or desire to do battle with the banks. And I think that was, he would be, a, unless he had this crusade, like you and I do, to bring about reform. If his interest is just to be president of the United States, as sort of like my crowning achievement in life, uh, then he'd be a fool to take on the Fed because they would 
they would crash the economy and say, see what happened now that Mr. Trump is came into office. They could have done that before. Um, so I don't think Mr. Trump really has any intention of challenging the Fed, although he's made some nice statements, public statements about the Fed. Oh, we got to really do something about that. Interest rates, you know, we got to get, get, take control back. He all says a lot of good things. And sometimes he'll actually start to do something, but you notice the ocean halfway down the track, he turns around and comes back. So I changed my mind. And so I don't have, I don't have much faith in Mr. Trump, not because he's Mr. Trump, but because he's a politician now. And this is, you, I know from the way the game is set up, you, you cannot play this game unless you are a politician and will imply, follow the rules. So I think Mr. Trump is following the rules. And uh, I do know that, um, uh, the rules are that um, you can't be one-sided. You have to give the public the illusion that there's a battle going on. Even though you control both sides, if the public knew that, that they wouldn't be so enthusiastic about getting out the vote. And, you know, they think that they're determining their own political destiny. If they, if they thought it was all rigged, well, then it wouldn't work. So in order to create the illusion that it's not rigged, you've got to have a battle going on. And the more fierce the battle, the better it is. Public loves it. Ah, look what they're doing. Oh, we love, we love this guy because we hate his enemies. Now, if it's just on his own, we wouldn't care. But look how bad his enemies are. So he must be good. You see, this is a game. This is how they play it. You cannot, you cannot have a war unless you have two sides. You cannot have the drama of a conflict unless you've got two sides. And this is how it works in the controlling of the mind and creation of of uh, a public opinion and political loyalties. It's just a You've show. You have a battle. It's just a show. Yes. Amazing. Now, um, sir, do you believe that we will see a gold standard again? And if so, do you see it being far off in the future or could it in fact be right around the corner? Well, I, I honestly believe that we will see a gold standard again. I hope we will, because if we don't, that means that we pretty well lost everything. Because money, money is the, you know, the life stream, the blood supply of any economy, any nation, er, any culture. And if you take all the real blood out and just put ketchup into the veins and call it blood, it may look okay it may pump through the veins okay but the organism is going to die because it's not really blood every society every nation needs real money a medium of exchange it has value if people are going to survive in that society as free individuals because money is merely a form of property it's your storehouse of what property you've been able to accumulate over your life and property is necessary if you're going to remain independent from state control. If you have no property, and that's the, one of the reasons all of the, the collectivist systems of the world, like communism, socialism, fascism, Nazism, all of the isms that are variants of collectivism, they all advocate the abolishment of private property. Why? It's because if you have property, you have the ability to be independent. You don't need to depend on the state. And the state that wants to control you cannot tolerate your independence. And so you must not have property. So you have to come to us and do what we tell you or else you will not be able to eat. It's as simple as that. And, and so um, if, if money, which is a form of property, it's a means of, of exchange between various asset classes, you can or trade something for something else. If that is not really property at all, if it's just digital, or if it's um, if it's somehow created out of thin air, like the banks created now, and it has no value, and if, for whatever reason, if the if this the powers that be, as we were talking about a moment ago, have total control over the money system, which means no gold standard, that's for sure. That means you and I don't have property, really. It's, well, what we have, then, is only what they give us or allow us to have, which means that we are now slaves. So that's the long way of saying the reason I am a, a real strong 
advocate of the gold standard is not because I care about gold or I don't care to be the richest man in the world or anything like that. It's because I know it's the gold standard and gold or silver or something of intrinsic value as a backing for the money supply is essential for the money supply to work as blood in the veins of society and allow people to be free. Now, is this going to happen? And the way it's going now, it's going in the other direction. If, if unless there's a change in the trend and in the thinking of the people, it's not going to happen. But it's up, it's up to us who see the whole picture to change that environment. We have to become change agents, so to speak. We have to educate people. We have to show them that you're being fooled, you're being tricked, you're being, it, it's like Pinocchio being led to the carnival. You're being led, you're going to be made a jackass. Uh, you're going into slavery, everybody. Can't you see that? And so if we can succeed in delivering that message, then like Pinocchio, there is hope for us. We can get out of the trap and we can go out and be real and eventually become, like Pinocchio, a real human being someday. Now, Ed, you have become a legend, and I know that you are the author of many spectacular works, but The Creature of Jekyll Island is a book that is widely considered to be a masterpiece in terms of modern-day economics. It really blows apart the reader's sense of what they thought they knew when they read it. What brought that book to life? Uh, well, I, I'll give you the short version. Okay. Okay. I don't know. <laughs> and it's the truth. I started that project without any idea of what I was getting into. Uh, everybody goes through that experience. Well, this one was in spades. You know, how many times have you started down a path that if you had you known at the time where that path was leading, you would have turned around and run for your life. <laughs> it was just too big a path. Well, that was the case with this book. I thought I was just going to do a little documentary film on the cause of inflation. And of course, that led me to the engine of inflation, which is the Federal Reserve. I didn't know much about it. I just knew that, yeah, they, I think they make money there, don't they? You know, that kind of thing. And so I, that's what started me on the path. And uh, it's like every time I opened one of those doors that I was talking about before, I thought, well, look at the room I'm in now. Isn't this interesting? And there were a couple of more doors on the walls around there. So when I was through devouring the information in this room, I start opening up some of these other doors. And oh my gosh, there's so many rooms after rooms after rooms. And so I didn't really know what I was getting into. I find an old book, for example, that I never heard of. And, and um, oh, this is really interesting. And look, it's got some good facts about the origin of the Fed. And here's a quote from one of the founders. Uh, but I wonder if that quote is authentic. They don't say where they got the quote, so I think I'll look and see if I can find that quote and see if it's real. And if it's real, then where, what's the source? Because I know people won't believe it unless you tell them where the source is. So it was that kind of a process that kept leading me deeper and deeper into it. And uh, over this was about a seven-year project, okay? Um, a seven-year project, I think it's pretty safe to say. Meanwhile, I'm trying to put food on the table for my family. And writing books is, doesn't produce any food. Uh, selling books uh, sometimes can do that, but writing them doesn't. And so uh, I had to, you know, discipline myself. Come on, Griffin, you've already wasted seven years on this thing. And, uh, and I thought, oh, this is too big for me. And I actually quit um, two times for sure, and almost a third time. It's what they call that darkest moment of the night, you know, when you just – in the middle of the night, you realize that you've lost. You cannot win. There's no way you're going to come reach your goal. I thought, this is too big a topic. I, I'll, never, I'll never get it right. I'll never finish it. I've got to get back to making a living. And uh, so I quit. And, but it didn't take long, maybe a month or two after that. I back at it again. I, I couldn't leave it alone. But this is too important. I'm not trying to make a big deal out of it, but you asked me how that worked, and yes. that's how it, I just couldn't, I couldn't leave it alone. I thought, I've gone this far, maybe I could go a little bit further, and maybe I could finish it, and so another year went by, another couple of years, I quit again. I'm never going to finish this. Well, I'm back at it again, so it's, it's nothing more than that. It's just a lot of little tiny steps, none of which amount to anything. 
but over seven years, it's what happened. Wow. It's certainly today, it's, it's, a, it's a mainstay for many people I know. Ed, it is always an honor to have you on this show. Please tell everybody what you're doing today and how they can follow your work. Okay. All right. Thank you for that, by the way. I always, always forget to promote my stuff. My, the people that work with me say, hey, you forgot to, you forgot to plug something. I'm oh, yeah, sorry about that. I'll do it better next time. So, all right. Yeah, what am I doing today? Well, right now, almost all of my attention is focused on something called the Red Pill Expo. It's something that we started to do uh, three years ago. Red Pill Expo. Of course, most of your viewers, I'm sure, know about the Red Pill meme, you know, saying, take the Red Pill and wake up. See life the way it really is. So that's what we're putting on the Red Pill Expo. And the whole idea is to open up the stage and the two-day event to people that have discovered some truth. As you said a moment ago, reading the book, The Creature, opened up your eyes to things that you didn't know existed or were contradictory to what you thought existed. And these are red pills, in other words. And it's, my life is filled with, with learning to my amazement and chagrin in many cases that everything I thought was true on a very important topic like the banking system, for example, or like healthcare, or you name it. It turns out that it's not true at all. It's just the opposite in most cases of what I thought it was. And these are important issues that affect my life. So we thought that there are so many of these out there. Why don't we just have an expo and invite anybody who thinks that they have discovered a truth that is important to not only them, but everybody else, to come and tell us about it. Now, that doesn't mean we endorse everything that they have to say, but who knows? We might after we hear what they have to say. That's yeah. right. <laughs> who knows? You have to open up your mind. You know, if you say, I'm a truth seeker, that means you have to admit that you don't have all the truths or you wouldn't be seeking truth. You say, I've got them all. Yeah. Well, we know that's impossible. So, all right. The, the Red Pill Expo is going to be held in June, June 7, 8, and 9 in Hartford, Connecticut. And uh, we've already get, we've started on this, the, the uh, program. It's, I won't even tell you about it. I'll just say if you want to know who's speaking, that's, it's adding, we're adding to that list every day. We've got some really big names there. And uh, it's, I'll tell you, people love it. And I love it. I learn so much uh, every time. We've had, this is the third one coming up. So go to our website. And it's uh, redpillexpo.org redpillexpo.org, and you can see who's speaking, what they're going to be talking about, and uh, how much it costs, and where the event is, and a lot of testimonials from people that have attended the previous meetings, and they're all pretty supportive. You have huge names there. Really well, nice. What names do you see? <laughs> Del, you see Del Big Tree. You see Del. He's going to be there. He's the he's the producer of the movie Fat. I vaxed. He, there's a red pill. Vaccines. Oh my gosh! I thought vaccines were there to help us. I really did. You know. Um, well, anyway, I'll be speaking. Uh, I'm not sure, but I think I'm going to be speaking on a topic that sounds very dull, but is so exciting, and it's private property. Hmm. The reason I think I'm going to speak about that is because it's one of the holes left in my manuscript that I've been working on for my next book is private property. Everybody says, well, well, all the collectivists say you can't have private property because it's, it's not fair, it's unethical, you can't own the earth, and so forth. We you know all those arguments. They teach it in school, and they taught it to me. And, but then we know that the people who value private property as, as a means of freedom and independence, they say, well, it's very important. But I've never seen, in, to my uh, view, a complete analysis of why, why people believe both sides of this issue and how to evaluate one side against the other. So I decided, okay, now is the time to do that. And I'm getting into it, and I think, oh my gosh, this is really interesting. Even though I thought I knew all about these things, <laughs> a lot of things I did not know about it. You so are I'm an explorer. wondering again, so that's probably what I'm going to talk about. And uh, who else do you see on that list there? Oh, I've seen all. Uh, is Berwick going to be there? Uh, Jeff Berwick is going to be there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I've seen and all kinds of We're going to be talking about cryptocurrencies. Mm -hmm. And those aren't necessarily what everybody thinks they are either. Yes. Hmm. Uh, we, yeah, we, Do we, tell. <laughs> yeah. It's, um, wouldn't it be surprising to find out 
that the very people who we thought were the biggest opponents of cryptocurrency, meaning the banks and the governments, are actually, they can hardly wait for it to come along because they intend to control it. Wouldn't that be a red pill? Yes. Hmm. Well, that gives you an idea. There's so much out there, and all of this and more will be at the Red Pill Expo. Now, of course, we know most people can't actually go to Hartford mm-hmm. in June, but it's all going to be live streamed. And uh, I think it, well, it's a pitiful little amount of money. I think it's $25 or something like that. You can watch both days on the, um, on the Internet. And uh, for seven days after the program, you can watch it again. And so we intend to get the word out to millions and millions of people. Educational. So come, come to look us up. Right, mm-hmm. right, right. Dot org. Beautiful, beautiful. Ed, thank you so much for coming on the show today. Thanks for inviting me. And I, I apologize for rambling, but you did tell me before the show that rambling was okay. Rambling is okay, sir, when it's you. It's, it's, we want to hear everything you've got to say. <laughs> Mr. G. Edward Griffin, modern day legend, whose 30 years of extraordinary work is covered in our free exclusive report at PortfolioWealthGlobal.com slash G. For the industry experts panel, I'm Michelle Holliday at PortfolioWealthGlobal.com. We just released interviews with the man who exposes the deep state and the shenanigans of Washington better than anybody else, Robert David Steele. And I highly suggest going to PortfolioWealthGlobal.com forward slash Robert. We also released an interview with silver expert David Morgan of The Morgan Report on PortfolioWealthGlobal.com forward slash Morgan for his best predictions. A Gerald Salente explosive interview including his key ideas at PortfolioWealthGlobal.com forward slash Salente. Of course, for the most accurate information on G. Edward Griffin's latest and best, go to PortfolioWealthGlobal.com forward slash Griffin. It's essential reading.